If you asked me to build a four-dimensional room, uh, obviously I couldn't do it because it's impossible. We only live in three dimensions. But if you asked me to show you what it would sound like if you played your guitar in that room, uh, actually, I could do that. Isn't that kind of weird, though? Like, I'm saying this thing can't possibly exist, but if it did exist, I know exactly what it would sound like. So a real sound that comes from an impossible object. I feel like that's an area that hasn't really been explored enough, actually. I don't think I'm going to make this, but I can imagine a series of audio plugins that generate sound from impossible objects. So, like, there would be uh, four-dimensional objects, maybe some MC Escher-style objects, or some really impractical objects, like a guitar with a black hole in the middle. Like, what would that sound like? Because black holes distort space and time, uh, so I can't imagine the sound coming from that being just like a normal guitar. I think all of this would be an extension of something called physical synthesis, which is essentially simulating sound from physics simulations uh, of a string or a metal bar or something like that. But normal stuff usually. If anybody makes a physical synthesis engine for impossible objects, uh, please tell me, because that sounds super cool. Back to the 4D reverb. If you want to play around in the fourth dimension, uh, it's actually not that much harder than playing around in lower dimensions. So for my reverb, I originally wanted to use the wave equation. So I started with one dimension, uh, which is a string. And here's that simulation. I would essentially put my signal into one end and measure the output at the other end. Here's the equation, but the only reason I'm showing you this is so that you can see how easy it is to go up in dimension. You just add another dimension here. Now we have the wave equation of a 2D surface. If we had another dimension, now we're working in 3D. So if you can make a simulation of a wave on a string, you're 90% of the way there to making it a wave in four dimensions. Adding extra terms to the wave equation doesn't make it that much more complicated. So why not just add one more term, and then another, and then another, and suddenly we're working in this impossible sci-fi fourth dimension. Physically, it's pretty cool, but uh, mathematically, it's kind of boring, actually. You can just keep adding dimensions willy-nilly. Why not simulate reverb from a room with a thousand dimensions? A good reason not to do that is because of the computational complexity. Actually, by the time I got to the fourth dimension, it was already too big. So if I simulate a wave on a string with like 100 points on it, I would need 10,000 points to simulate something comparable in two dimensions because a comparable flat surface would be 100 points by 100 points. And if you move to 3D, now we have to simulate a million points because the room would be 100 by 100 by 100. Maybe there's an efficient way to do it, but I decided my best option was to switch to ray tracing. You might have heard about ray tracing from video games or the computer graphics world. If not, it's uh, essentially just drawing a straight line from your light source to whatever is going on in your scene letting it bounce around and possibly land on your virtual camera. If you send out enough of these rays, you end up with a physical simulation of how your light source would illuminate a space. So you can actually do the same thing with sound. The only difference is when you catch a ray, you just have to record at what time it came back and how many times it bounced off a wall. You don't have to worry about your camera optics or whatever. So we're gonna send a ray in four dimensions and we're gonna record how much time it took and how many walls it bounced off of. Those two things will determine what it sounds like after its journey. Let's just imagine one ray that's emitted from this point bounces off two walls and arrives in our detection region. We're gonna record how long it took to make that trip and how many walls it bounced off of. Now, if we imagine that ray was carrying our guitar sound, we can delay that from coming out of your speakers by the time it took for the ray to travel from here to here. We have an equation for how sound reduces in volume based on how long it spends traveling through the air, so we can apply that to the sound as well. We also have an equation for how the sound is affected by hitting walls of a certain material, so we'll apply that too. Now we repeat this process for another ray. This new ray might have traveled a longer distance and bounced off more walls, like maybe 50, so the guitar signal that follows that ray will come out of your speakers a lot later and be a lot quieter. It'll probably sound more muffled, too, because uh, every time it hits a wall, the high frequencies are damped more than the low frequencies. 
If we do this thousands of times, we'll end up playing the same guitar signal out of your speaker thousands of times, but at different times, and the later guitar signals will come out quieter and more muffled, which should sound like reverb because that's roughly what happens in a real room. Reverb is just a bunch of echoes that are smushed together and overlapping each other. So what that means for me is I have to simulate a bunch of rays bouncing around in a four-dimensional room, uh, which might sound scary, but it's uh, pretty similar to drawing a normal graph. Like, a line is just connecting two coordinate points. In two dimensions, you could define a line as these two coordinate points. They have x and y. In 3D, you just need to add another number so that we know where the line begins and ends on the z-axis. So now we have x, y, and z. And four dimensions is nothing special, just add another number. My ray, which carries the guitar signal, is just a line, and the room is just a bunch of lines, so there's really not much more to it. I mean, I have to figure out how the angle of the ray would bounce off the wall in four dimensions, and the length of the ray for determining how long it would take the sound to travel that distance, but increasing the dimensionality of that stuff is just as easy as doing it for the wave equation or coordinate points. Like, here's the Pythagorean theorem in 2D, and 3D, and 4D. Not too bad. So at the end of the simulation, I actually get something called an impulse response. I might make a video on that later, because it's pretty interesting. But for now, I'll just say that it's a good way to store the reverb of a room, because pretty much every audio program can read impulse responses. Okay, now for the big disappointing reveal. It just sounds like a big room. That makes sense though. After watching this video, uh, it should be apparent that more dimensions just means more space for the sound to travel through. There's nothing super magical that happens as sound passes through the fourth dimension. I guess one interesting note is that I think it sounds less tonal. Like if you send a sound through a string, it comes back ringing at whatever pitch the string is tuned to. That's sort of like the sound of spring reverb. <laughs> And a plate reverb is more like a two-dimensional reverb. It sounds less like ringing because there's more vibration modes. And there are even more vibration modes in 3D because now we have six walls for all sorts of bouncing around. That trend will continue as we add dimensions, which means a tesseract, which is a four-dimensional cube, will sound very diffuse with its eight boundaries. But who cares, because if you want diffuse reverb, you can just make your 3D geometry more complex. So the 4D reverb doesn't really contribute much sonically, uh, but like I said earlier, I think the concept of impossible instruments uh, does have some interesting potential. Maybe somewhere down the road I'll make one. I don't know. For now, I'll just leave you with a couple of final thoughts. Even though higher dimensionality didn't do much to our sound, uh, that doesn't mean there's nothing interesting going on. It's fun to play with the idea of interacting with a space beyond our own, and if you play with the transition from three to four dimensions, you get some pretty fun ideas. Maybe you've heard of the book Flatland, which uses the perspective of flat creatures interacting with 3D creatures in order to understand what it would be like for us to interact with four-dimensional creatures. I mean, a four-dimensional creature would be capable of seeing through your walls or into your stomach or into a safe. Uh, it could teleport, it could shapeshift, or it could just completely disappear. Actually, a while back, I heard about a video game which allowed you to travel through the fourth dimension. I haven't played it, but it sounds pretty cool. Okay, one last thought. Is there a fourth dimension? I mean, I kept saying there isn't one, so that's that. Okay, but seriously, is there a fourth spatial dimension? There's this tension between math and physics, where if you start off with a physics problem and you bring it into the math world and you work on it, a lot of times the math will predict something that turns out to be true in the physical world. Usually that's most dependable when we start with axioms that are confirmed by physics and only use those to come up with predictions. Uh, so maybe a fourth dimension wouldn't apply here because adding another dimension is not necessitated by physics. Or maybe it is, I don't know. 
Okay, I'm talking way out of my depth at this point, but apparently string theory requires either 10 or 11 dimensions, depending on the version. It's my understanding that string theory has yet to be welcomed into the physics community with the same level of acceptance as quantum or relativity, so maybe take that with a grain of salt. It's fun to think about, though. So go off and think about it. Okay, see you next time.